Okay, so um, reflecting on violence week four, um, we're going to look at the question of violence in the media today. And this is, this is actually a, a really foundational question in violence studies. Um, and it links to our big question of, of how do people think about violence and what is, what is how they think about it make them do? Um, so it's, it's really, remember, if we went back to the beginning of the course, we looked at that Gilligan reading, and Gilligan said that everyone already has ideas about violence. They already have these sort of intuitive theories, um, what violence is, what violence is happening, what violence they are at risk of, um, how that violence could be most effectively addressed. People already go through life with, with those ideas. They just don't know where they got those ideas from. They're not even aware of exactly how they formulated them, but they, they feel them in a particular way. And they respond to other people and they respond to external reality and they respond to political election campaigns based on those, those ideas and they, they do certain stuff. Um, and we've seen that already. We've seen like, for instance, in, you know, in, in the United States, people buy guns because of a certain idea of violence. Um, and um, so I don't want you to just focus on the details of the Apex Gang. I want you to understand the details of the Apex Gang, but I want you to look at it as an example of a type of thing. That's, that's what we're really getting at here. Not, that, not just the media construction of the Apex Gang itself, but how that kind of process works. And you can apply it to anything. Um, certainly the Apex Gang is not the first moral panic about a gang that has occurred in Australian history by any means. Um, uh, two decades before, there was a, there was a huge um, anxiety around um, um, Middle Eastern gangs in Sydney. Uh, through, th historically, through all the waves of migration, um, uh, early migrants have been uh, associated with forming gangs and involved in criminality, including uh, European migrants. Uh, various waves of migration from Mediterranean Europe, from Eastern Europe, have always been associated with um, um, criminality, gangs, threats to society, and even the, the, the original function of Australia as a penal colony and the, the, the fact that, that many of the early involuntary settlers um, were associated with criminality. Um, and it changes over time. So the examples change, but the process remains the same. So, you know, um, 2016, 17, 18, it was all about the Apex Gang. Uh, in the future, it'll be about something else. Uh, uh, for a long time, there was the massive obsession with um, Islamic terrorism. Um, and, and so we see these waves. Um, and so really what this lecture is about is about understanding how, why and how do these things happen? Why does the media seize on certain things? How do they get the public to start understanding those things? What does the public then do in reaction? And then how does that influence the whole society? So it's really that, that process, and you're already familiar with the notion of a moral panic, which will be one of our key sort of organizing theories here. Um, and it's important that you look at that theory in detail, that you don't just have a superficial grasp of it, that you actually uh, think in detail about how moral panics occur and exactly what something has to be to sort of achieve the kind of theoretical um, requirements of being classified as a moral panic. Okay, so the example of the Apex Gang. Melbourne, March 2016, Mumba Festival. Um, a, a kind of fight broke out. A bunch of kids, you know, started shouting at each other, um, getting into little fights, throwing things, and it's kind of escalated. A whole bunch of young people kind of joined in, and eventually there may have been up to 200 people involved as kind of running kind of dispute that happened. Um, and of course, the Mumba Festival, this was a uh, intended to be a kind of a family space, a fun day out with the family, a nice, safe thing to do with them um, in a, in a um, positive environment. Suddenly, there are these, they're these teenagers um, behaving badly, causing trouble, uh, shouting, throwing stuff, punching each other. And the media went 
crazy for this story. They really, really got <laughs> kind of obsessed with it. Um, and it was everywhere like this was like a catastrophe that this lovely family event got turned into a, a dangerous space of, of kind of hooliganism. Um, and the story then came out that the, a, a lot of the young people involved in this were involved with one of two gangs, that there were really two gangs at work um, and two gangs from different kind of um, uh, ethnic groups. The one was um, the Apex Gang, which were believed to be um, uh, South Sudanese uh, teenagers, um, and the other Island of 23. Um, um, and these two gangs are sort of having a standoff and, and making kind of members of public or scared. Okay. Um, but the interesting thing is that this, this idea, this idea of this, this gang of South Sudanese teenagers really took off and then started being linked to a whole lot of other stuff that was going on. The, exactly the kinds of crimes that people don't like. And it's interesting, look, look at what kind of violence people sort of get upset about in the media. Um, and one of the things that it was, there were, there were kind of you know, robberies like, uh, um, going on, but, but home invasions. And why is a home invasion such a kind of emotional topic? Okay, why is having people come into your home while you're there and sort of threaten you and steal stuff? Why is that um, such a big issue? And of course, because, you know, if, if there's one place people would like to feel safe in society, it's in their own home. To some extent, people can accept that there might be dangerous spaces that they should avoid in the external world. Oh, don't go there at night. Uh, don't hang out in that area, and and they they'll be prepared to 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 do that. But but going home, closing the door, relaxing with the people closest to you, that should be a safe space. Um, and so when 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 threats, disruption, violence enter those spaces, that's that that that's really alarming to people. Now, what's interesting about that we're going to talk about in future weeks is that, in fact, home spaces are not safe for a lot of people. That the, 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 the myth of the home as being a safe space, in fact, is not true for many people for many different reasons. But, 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 but this reaction assumes that it's true. Okay. And so, so kind of panic about, about home invasions in certain areas and of course, this became organized around a particular kind of entity in the media. And this, this, the, this particular entity was the youth of African appearance. And, and this becomes the kind of organizing slogan that, that suddenly all of these disturbing acts, all of these nice, nice family day that got disrupted, people sitting at home and having teenagers come in and, and steal their stuff and threaten them, um, becomes associated with the idea of a youth of African appearance. Okay, um, and that it's an interesting it's an interesting a, a idea. We need to look at the way in which that works. Once a phrase like that starts circulating, how does it work? What does it do? Um, what kinds of experience of the world does it create? And what kinds of experience of the world does it hide? Um, so, so this idea of youth of African experience were then associated with um, young Sudanese men, um, South Sudanese migrants, um, and associated with a kind of ex um, excessive, not just petty crime, not just graffiti, not just, you know, hooliganism on the streets, not just petty thop um, shoplifting, but, but, uh, but threats of violence. Um, and particularly threats of violence in people's homes. Um, what's interesting, of course, is that when you are a start actually um, seeing the interviews, watching the videos, reading the um, research report, um, that these are highly contested, these interpretations. Um, and, what, and so we need to look at that. We need to look at how do contested interpretations come to exist and how do they come to have a certain kind of social power? Um, okay, so what I want to do today is to say, 
let's look at the apex gang as an interpretative framework. My, my primary question is not even the question of was there an apex gang or not? Did this, did this gang in fact in reality exist? Okay, um, that's an interesting question, but I want to ask a slightly different one, is if we take the term, the apex gang, okay, and first of all, or, realize that this is not simply a label for a little part of external reality, but this is an interpretative framework. And that we always understand violence through interpretative frameworks. This is the point. We, that, that violence do, is, is not just an object in the world that exists. It's always an interpretation. And remember, even the word violence can mean so many different things. Um, so we're always trying to get at like what, what, what are, what, what is the, the, the way we are understanding things? How is that making us understand reality? And this idea that we always have these interpretive frameworks, and it's for everything. So the notion of a serial killer, for instance, makes us interpret certain kinds of crime in a certain kind of way. The notion of a pedophile makes us interpret certain kinds of crime in a certain way. Um, and those are not just neutral descriptions of reality. Those are things that make us organize things in, in certain ways. They, they make us group together certain kinds of threats and offenses um, and to not group other threats and offenses together and to highlight certain ones and become anxious about them while we tend to overlook others. And that's the process I want you to be paying attention to. Okay, so... When we, say, when we say we want to look at Apex Gang as a, not, not as a thing in the world, but as an interpretative framework for that, that, that structures people, people's idea of violence, what questions do we want to ask about it? Firstly, we want to say, what problems does it identify and highlight? Okay. Um, so having an interpretative makes things, bring certain things into focus, into the foreground. Um, so what does the apex gang um, draw attention to? Um, linked to that is what things does it include and what things does it exclude? So when you use that concept, when you use the concept of the apex gang, what things are left out, what kinds of threats, what kinds of violence are left out, and what kinds are, are grouped together um, and brought to attention? Third thing is... As, a, as, as an interpretative framework, and thus as a kind of theory of violence, what assumptions does the, does the concept apex gang assert about the causes of violence? And linked to that, what concepts does it assert about the solutions to violence? Okay. Linked to our former question, what then gets lost? If, if we're using that as our organizing concept, it's drawing certain things together, it's drawing certain things into focus, it's making us aware of certain things, it makes us worried about certain things, it makes us imagine certain causes and certain solutions, but what does it hide? What gets ignored? What gets not seen when we are interpreting um, social, uh, a range of social problems through the notion of the apex game? Um, and linked to that is what problems does it create? By, by using this concept of the apex gang to talk about certain things, what social and practical problems get created? Okay, so all of these questions are questions about the fact that we don't just want to know what theories we have, we want to know what our theories do. Okay, this is the important thing. Our concepts, our theories do certain th things, and they do things both at the level of thinking, in terms of our understanding, in terms of our attention, but they do things at the level of our feelings, our emotions, um, our reactions, our worries, and they do things at the level of they either create or they solve social problems. Um, and this is what's really important, that ideas either create or help solve practical problems in the world around us. Um, and this is the thing I want us to look at with Apex Gang. Okay, so um, what problems does it identify and highlight? Okay, firstly, it draws our attention to certain kinds of crime and certain kinds of violence, okay? Um, and specifically street crimes, um, antisocial behavior in public, 
um, but also invasions of personal space and specifically the use of um, kind of low level threats and weapons. Typically, Apex not associated with things like gun violence, um, the way in which certain kinds of criminal gangs are, but still the use of everyday kind of objects as, as in a threatening way, the use of go golf clubs or sticks to threaten people. So certain kinds of, cr certain kinds of antisocial behavior, street disruption, kind of hooliganism, um, certain threats to personal space, home invasion, certain uh, threats of violence. So not so much acts of violence, but, but the threatening of members of the public with kind of um, non-lethal weapons or less lethal, le lethal weapons. Okay, what range of things does it include and what does it exclude? Okay, um, now to focus on Apex Gang, which is also to focus on home invasions, excludes something else really interesting that I hinted at before. The forms of violence that are already in the home, before anyone comes in, before any outsider breaks into the house and starts threatening someone. Focusing on home invasion, uh, what, that, what that excludes is the fact that many homes are already violent. The members of the household can be threatening, bullying, emotionally abusive, physically abusive, okay? And it excludes that. Um, it also excludes um, the, the violence between members of the same community which is in fact one of the highest patterns of violence. People tend to get, violence tends to happen between people of the same community, kind of people of the same social group getting into bar fights and things like that. That's, that's a very common pattern. Violence between communities is actually less common, but, but the notion of the apex stresses the existence of an ethnic community that is threatening to another ethnic community, okay? Even though those are far less common uh, forms of violence. Um, the other thing it does is it links what might otherwise be a set of unrelated incidents, um, a, 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 a youth conflict that escalated at a, at a public festival, uh, a series of um, uh, a, a, a period of, of home invasions in certain suburbs, a few crimes against businesses, um, and it links all of the, those crimes. Those are relatively small subset of all the crimes that occur, but it links them all together. And it says these are these are not just ten, like twenty percent of the crimes that exist in society that are kind of randomly distributed. To no, there's a thread. There's a thread that makes us conceptualize those crimes as linked. Okay. Um, and in as much as it links them, it says that there's a systematic underlying problem, okay? And um, the link it creates on the next slide, um, what assumptions does it assert about the causes of violence and the solutions to violence, okay? What it links is appearance, physical appearance, literally skin tone. The notion of the youth of African appearance, this is to say that the particular kind of young man, and notice it is men as usual, just like City of God, it's men. This is not a story about women. Um, particular kind of, of, of young men in a particular age group, but with a noticeable visible experience. You can look at them from 30 meters away and you can see a defining visual characteristic, which is a darker skin tone. And that becomes the thing. It's the darker skin tone that becomes the thread. And that then gets conceptually linked to this idea of a particular migrant community, specifically um, South Sudanese migrants who have fled the um, state of civil war. And it, um, and, 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 it, and it then not only says that this problem is linked to that community, but that that entire community represents a threat to the rest of society. Okay, so it links a, a kind of a, vi a visible visual marker to an idea of a group of people, um, maps that onto a particular social community, 
and then create an idea of that community as dangerous. Okay. This then, having done that, having brought um, those things together, it then does the very important work. And this is the thing we need to look at. It implies a solution. Okay. Having, having created that connection between these disparate set of offenses, um, this visually identifiable um, uh, members of these, these visually identifiable members of society, and the idea that they belong to a group that is an outsider group that is potentially threatening. This leads to the idea that we know what to do about that. And, and what we need to do about that is then to take action against that group. Okay. And the two things that immediately get put on the table is the question of imprisonment and the question of deportation. These become these, these, these sort of then jump out of that story as possible solutions. So, so you see a lot of the, 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 the kind of press commentary and, and comments that are lifted from the public um, about, about the um, alleged threat of the Apex gang is, um, is that the courts are, are being soft on, on youth, that they're not, they're not, they're refusing to imprison teenagers, they um, refusing to hold them on remand, that with juvenile offenders, the courts are much more inclined to say, let's try and rehabilitate them in the community. Let's not incarcerate them in the company of, 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 of um, adult prisoners. Um, and so, so, so there starts being this, this, this sort of counter pressure towards uh, imprisonment, incarceration, punishment as the solution. So it's not being keep this community separate, but also punish them. Um, and the two ways of, 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 of keeping them separate are one through incarceration and second through deportation. So the other big call becomes to revoke the visas of people who are migrants, uh, to deport them back to their country of origin, um, regardless of the situation there. Okay. Um, and all of these follow sort of logically from the idea, or perhaps they don't follow in an in a strictly logical way but they but, but there's a kind of a flow of ideas okay now you can see that easily you can see the idea from uh these these crimes are linked we they're, they're, there's there's a visibly identifiable category of person that uh, that category represents a particular community that community thus represents a threat what we can do is exclude them through imprisonment and deportation you can see how that flow of ideas work but what is it, what gets lost in that flow of ideas? What, are, what important ideas get silenced when that way of thinking starts operating? Okay. Um, and of course, what, what people stop thinking about when they're caught up in that anxiety is firstly, that in fact, these patterns may be organized differently. Um, that in fact, there may be different things at work. Um, and, and, and it becomes interesting that most of these, the, these activities the police are quick to say actually involve multiple groups. And when we look at the statistics, in fact, at least 80% um, uh, of, 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 the, of, of the, 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 those categories of crime are, um, are committed by Australians of European descent. Um, but all of that gets lost. But also what gets lost on an explanatory level is other ways of looking at it, of saying, well, isn't this a, actually more about, about m men, about young men? And remember, we talked about that with City of God. Isn't it about being a teenager, struggling with certain kinds of masculinity? Th those, kind of those kinds of questions get lost, and those may actually be more inclusive, comprehensive questions. But what gets lost there is an entire line of thinking Firstly, of, of identifying psychological issues. Are the people involved with those crimes, are they actually subject to certain kinds of stresses, certain kinds of um, emotional trauma, um, certain kinds of, of social pressures that are, that are drawing them into um, these pa patterns of antisocial behavior? And couldn't we find a way of doing something about that? Um, and so looking at underlying issues, looking at the underlying social issues 
Um, what challenges are, 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 are people involved with this kind of offense um, facing? Could we address those? Um, would that be a more effective way of removing this problem that applies not just to a particular um, upsurge of a problem at a particular moment, but applies broadly to making the entire society safer? Okay. Um, so all of that gets lost. A whole lot of preventative thinking, a whole lot of social thinking, a whole lot of psychological thinking gets lost. And the focus becomes on punishment, retribution, separation, exclusion. Um, what, 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 what problems does that create? So, so if, the, if the interpretative framework makes us think all those things, what, 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 what's wrong with that? Firstly, the way of thinking created by the notion of the apex gang primarily creates fear, okay? And that's why it's there. It is, it, it, it's, it's a reason for existence is to create fear. Um, and that's what the media love. The media, the, the media need to draw people's attention. That's how they sell the newspapers. That's how they get the clicks. Um, they need to they need to alarm people to distract them and say, "Oh my God! Like I need to, I, I want I, I need to know what that headline's about. I need to, um, um, you know, I, ne I need to click that link." Um, and so and 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 creating anxiety, creating fear is the fastest and easiest way of doing that. So that the so notion of the apex gang um, emerges as a deliberate way of creating fear, not initially out of the end point of, of trying to create a society in fear, but simply out of the commercial desire to create a moment of anxiety in people in order to get them to respond, uh, to order to make money by getting them to, to buy the newspaper, change the television channel, click on the link. Okay. The fact that that fear then becomes part of that social world and that becomes toxic in that social world and start producing anxiety um, on, on, uh, beyond the consumption of the media. The, me the creators of the media just don't care about that. Um, they don't care about the, the harmful effect they're having on society because it's not, it's, not, um, uh, it's not significant for their commercial interest. In fact, it, if anything, it serves their commercial interest positively, having created a kind of a backdrop of fear of fear of Islamic terrorists or, or South Sudanese youth, that, that plugs people into always wanting to hear those stories, always being saying, oh, we'd better find out what's happening now. Um, so it creates fear, but that fear then does other things. The fear then in turn creates, creates prejudice, creates anger, creates hatred. Okay, so it starts breaking the society down. It starts producing antagonism rather than social integration. It starts breaking down social cohesion. Um, and this is, um, this is a very, very significant outcome that we need to think about. Um, because one of the reasons people often become involved with antisocial activities is because they already feel excluded. They already feel that the society doesn't accept them. The society is hostile to them. It's more difficult for them to get jobs. Um, they get treated badly. And that, 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 that often within marginalized communities creates a kind of resentment that leads to, to committing antisocial acts because of not feeling integrated, not feeling like they share a space in that society. So this creation of fear, the creation of, of, of hatred, the creation of prejudice actually makes it worse. It makes those social tensions, those feelings of alienation much worse. And thus actually feeds into the, the marginalized groups and individuals becoming more at risk um, of behaving in antisocial ways. It also then creates a kind of emotional commitment to certain kinds of reaction, which we talked about before. So it means people start in their anger, they start wanting punishment rather than, um, than other sorts of reaction. It becomes less important to solve the problem and more important to express their anger. So the, 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 the longer sentences, worse prison conditions, Im immediate deportation, 
Um, these become the punitive ways of thinking that kind of make emotional sense out of the, the fear and anger. Um, and what they do is they completely um, then hide the fact that they are far more effective, cheaper, more effective, more positive um, alternative interventions that, that, that could be um, invoked to create, um, create solutions. But those get lost because they don't fit with the emotion, they don't fit with the anxiety, they don't fit with the rage that has been created by the, by, by the sense of feeling scared. And what's really interesting about this is when you look at it, um, and when you look at in, in, in that, a, a, that Apex Gang Research Project, the way in which this then becomes politicized, um, that pattern, that responses to threats tend to be politicized. And it's really interesting because the way in which sort of broadly progressive, you know, sort of labor, greens, uh, you know, Democrats in other societies versus conservative um, political groupings, they tend to respond to the sense of something being wrong socially in different ways. And they tend to cluster together. All kind of political grouping, conservative political groupings tend to respond in one way and all progressive political groupings tend to respond. It's not universal, but there's a, they're very, very strong tendencies. And the more conservative ones tend to be drawn to this kind of anxiety leading to anger, leading to punishment, imprisonment, social exclusion, death penalty, carrying firearms to kill people who threaten you, uh, deporting people who seem uh, to be different from you. And the, the kind of progressive political um, organizations tend to focus on, on solving those problems in different ways solving problems by, by trying to integrate people in society, trying to solve problems preventatively to say, wait a minute, what even led this to happen? Can we address that? Can we address the, the underlying social issues um, that created that risk situation? Can we ad address the particular psychological stresses that were placed on individuals that led them to behave in these antisocial ways? Um, and so we see that, and we saw it in City of God, we saw the difference between an analysis that said, actually, the social inequalities of that um, Brazilian society were, were, were absolutely foundational versus the, the supporters of current Brazilian President uh, Bolsonaro, who is all about um, you know, tough on crime, law enforcement, giving police who are already extremely violent, even more powers. Um, to be violent towards the public, even towards, you know, to the point of supporting the kind of military dictatorship that, it, that historically had existed um, in Brazil. So it's interesting to see these, these patterns of reaction, these interpretive frameworks actually creating a worldview and creating a kind of a politics. And that politics is really an expression of, 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 of a feeling, of a feeling of like, what should we do when, when, when we feel unsafe? Should, is, does it make more sense to become angry and hostile and punitive? And in, in a sense, what all of those things are, does it make sense to become more violent? Does it, is, is the right way to respond to feeling threatened to respond by becoming more violent? Uh, and that's exactly what we saw with, with the American example of the right to bear arms. Like what you should do about the fact that there might be criminals around is arm yourself, get a gun and shoot anyone who threatens you versus the other approach, which says, wait a minute, let's make the society um, uh, organized in a way that doesn't make people vulnerable, that doesn't put people at risk of either offending or victimization, that, that includes people, that provides people with uh, social services, mental health services, economic opportunities. Um, and, and so you can see these, the divergence of philosophies um, depending on how people kind of react emotionally to the sense of vulnerability. Okay. And of course, foundational to all of this is the theory of moral panics that you've acquainted yourselves with before. Okay. Now, I don't want you to just have a superficial view of moral panics. It's not just like, oh, the media exaggerates things and people freak out. Yeah, that, that's it. 
but you've got to look at the detail and the subtlety of moral panics. And if you're writing about it in your assignment, you've really got to break it down. There's many component parts to the idea of, of moral panic. Um, firstly, of course, it starts with the idea of a threat. There's a social threat. There's, there's a threat to the, not just to an individual, but to the, to the very fabric of society, okay? Uh, a threat to the, to the dominant social values and interests. And that threat comes from a, in a sense, a group that is outside of, of, of those social values. It, it, like there's a, there's, a, there's a delinquent group, there's an antisocial group that doesn't really fit in um, with those values and that group is threatening. Okay, so what the media does is it jumps on that and it then starts selling it up um, in the way that media needs to do. So, in, uh, so, so here, the media focuses on the threat, it starts ignoring all the other risks and harms and really amplifying that particular threat, making it seem more pervasive, more dangerous, more um, overwhelming. Um, and as a result, the people who are consuming the media, people who are clicking the links, watching the news, reading the papers, get more and more afraid. They feel more and more vulnerable. And as they feel more and more vulnerable, there's also a risk that they feel more and more angry and hostile. Okay. And in creating this threat, a, a, a scapegoat is created. Okay. Uh, someone is identified. Um, uh, South Sudanese youth. Muslim terrorists, um, uh, you know, these, 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 these what, what, what um, Stanley Cohen calls folk devils are created, this kind of this image of, the, of, of, of what the threat looks like, who it is. Um, and then a whole lot of people then get consulted um, as experts. And people are usually not experts, people who don't really understand uh, the, the research behind kind of crime and safety and victimization and offending, but people who have strong opinions, uh, religious leaders, politicians start getting consulted. Um, and this is what Cohen calls the, these, these people moral crusaders, people who, who have a, are trying to sell a worldview. Um, they start getting consulted as experts, even though they're in fact not experts, and they start strongly influencing what's going on. Um, and what starts happening is increasing social antagonism, that the, the tension between the kind of the group that feels threatened and the group that are identified as a threat become bigger and bigger. That actually makes the situation then much worse and much more dangerous. Um, but it also leads to these calls for particular kinds of intervention. And, they, and, and at that point, once people are scared, once they're angry, once they feel this the kind of outsiders threatening them, they tend to call for certain kinds of intervention and, and they tend to be destructive interventions. They tend to call for the tough on crime. You know, try, to, try children as if they're adults, longer jail sentences, worse jail con uh, conditions, um, sometimes kind of extreme punishments, death penalty, um, uh, other kinds of social exclusion, deportation, um, so, so, so these adversarial, punitive, hostile um, sort of responses sort of take over from all the other possible, more positive um, responses. And so we, and we really start seeing that. We start seeing that happen with the Apex gang. Um, and then we, when we look in detail at how the, the kind of idea of the Apex gang was constructed, we see this um, emphasis on um, on, on kind of African appearance, okay? So the idea of the dark skin tone creates a visibility. So certain offenders jump out. The ones who don't, aren't dark skin don't get noticed. Only the dark skinned ones get noticed. They get associated with the South Sudanese community. Um, all these events get linked together, like these random kind of street fights, uh, burglaries get linked together as if they're part of a, of a system. Um, the community like you know folks in the suburbs just wanting to live their lives be left alone and feel safe start feeling afraid the emotional vulnerability and trauma then starts becoming of an a media interest story and starts getting played up the way in which regular law abiding you know if you did the victimology you know like they're like good victims, ideal victims start being threatened. People who just want to sit at home and watch TV with their families 
um, and a certain kind of emotional language starts being used. Thugs, predators, heartless, lawless. So it's not just the, the offenses that are described. They're described as the, 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 they play up the antisocial, the, the allegedly violent nature. The fact that these people are, are different, that they, they're capable of worse things than the in-group are capable of. Um, and and that, that, then that gets kind of then mapped onto political fight, that the, that the political groups calling for the tough on crime, calling for the retribution, calling for the punishment, rather than solving our underlying problems, start attacking the other political groups and using this to score political points and trying to gain political leverage out of um, the situation of social anxiety by claiming that they have the solution and that the other end of the political spectrum is will 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 lead to a kind of social breakdown, anarchy, chaos, um, uh, total vulnerability for everyone, and so that um, um, so that the entire kind of network of ideas starts making people understand their place in the world and the role of other people differently. And of course, we see the consequences, this disproportionate attention to what is really a, actually not very important threats, quite a small range of threats while overlooking bigger threats. The creation of this kind of fear and insecurity, how that fear and insecurity isn't led, doesn't lead to positive problem solving, but leads to kind of anger, hatred, and prejudice. Um, and how that gets mapped onto particular groups, particularly groups that are seen as, as relative outsiders in the society that for some reason aren't part of the dominant group in society. And how that is then used to incite violent responses. Uh, and what, and unfortunately what tends to happen is the violent responses then tend to incite violent counter responses. And it leads to an escalation of social tension and an, potentially an escalation of violence between the two groups. So rather than reducing it, it actually, that these, these, these punitive, retributive, hostile, prejudiced interventions actually lead to an escalation of the risk of violence rather than lowering it. Um, and at the same time, the terrible thing they do is that, that they draw all attention, all support from the positive um, and preventative interventions that could actually have been effective, that could have solved the problem, that if they received public support and political endorsement, that they could be brought in to actually address those underlying issues. 